So hi, for this video lecture, we will be focusing on the actual analog to digital converters that uh, convert your analog information to digital data. So our coverage for this video lecture will be on the general operation of ADCs and the types of ADCs, specifically flash and SAR. So to start, analog and digital converters need to do two things, that is sampling and quantization. Sampling simply means defining the signal at specific time points. So, and then quantization means representing that sampled information within a finite set of bits. So uh, when we talked about converting analog to digital uh, quantities in the previous lecture video, it mostly deals with the quantization. So sampling, uh, as the name suggests, is uh, picking specific points of your analog signal to represent as digital data. And then signals are usually sampled at a uniform rate called the sampling frequency, which is just the inverse of what was previously mentioned as the sample time. So in this example over here, we have an input signal at 101 kilohertz being sampled at a sampling rate of 1 megahertz or having a sample time of 1 microsecond. Next is the term we call Nyquist frequency, which is usually or actually equal to twice the highest frequency content of the input. So uh, if you're familiar with Fourier, all signals can be broken down into multiple sinusoids and the highest frequency sinusoid there multiplied, multiplies frequency by two will give you the Nyquist frequency. So the Nyquist frequency is usually considered the minimum sampling frequency wherein our signal can be recomposed again from digital to analog. So uh, in order to uh, make more sense out of this is this next term which is called aliasing. So aliasing is when two signals look the same due to undersampling or sampling under the Nyquist frequency. So here at the top is the same 101 kilohertz signal, and here at the bottom is a 899 kilohertz signal. As you can see here, if we just sample up to one megahertz, we can get exactly the same points that we will be getting at from a 101 kilohertz signal. So from so after we sample, if we just leave the dots there, they will look practically the same, and we won't be able to differentiate. And we may never know if it was indeed from a 101 kilohertz signal or a 899 kilohertz signal. So why this happens is more of a topic outside our course. So uh, as of the moment, let's just consider it as a uh, limitation of the sampling process. So uh, in addition to normal sampling, we have what we call as sample and hold which is wherein the sampled value is maintained for a period of time to give the time ADC to convert the sample signal or to quantize it, uh, quantize the sample value. So for example, here, at every, every time the clock is high, our sample data just follows the continuous time signal. But when the clock is low, our the data stays at the last observe continuous time value and every time the clock cycle is high that is when we get a discrete time and quantized value so sample hold is usually used whenever our quantization or the conversion does not happen very fast so uh, more on quantization we've discussed this before it's the simply mapping our uh, voltage values to a specific digital output. So in this way, uh, we previously looked at this as a mapping between one number line to another number line. Now we plotted it as an axis, making it look more of a transfer function to observe the fall, uh, to better show what the following terms will be meaning. So the first is the offset of our quantization, which basically means instead of normally outputting 
the digital output with the analog output. Uh, you need a certain less or certain more of the analog output before going from uh, digital output to digital output. So basically saying that, uh, yeah, your uh, your digital output is somewhat, somewhat has an offset. Another term used is linearity, which, is, which describes the transfer characteristic. So normally you would want every digital output to have as many, map to as many analog inputs possible. I mean, if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight digital outputs <clears throat> over a course of eight volts, you you'd assume that for every volt there exists one digital output for it, and that's evenly distributed. Now, if your ADC is nonlinear, for example here, so there are more values that will map to a zero zero one digital output that the than there is that will map to a 0, 1, 1 value. So is linearity a bad thing? Not necessarily. Sometimes you would want non-linearity to reduce the quantization error. So the quantization error is uh, the difference between the ADC output between that of an ideal converter or your actual analog data. So if our digital output one corresponds to a one volt, so we can say at when our input is at the middle, there is no quantization error. But between the steps, we get the maximum quantization errors. Now, if we have a non-linear uh, ADC, the quantization errors for the middle, for example, in this case, for the middle uh, voltages will be lower than those at the edges so you may want that if you know that the if you know that the information that you will be getting is more focused on voltages in this range rather than at the edges so next we will be talking about the types of adcs and how how they are usually categorized so uh, usually for ADCs, we compare the ADC resolution with the signal bandwidth, which is sort of synonymous with the speed. So in this region, we have fast ADCs, but very low less resolution. So that's for the flash, asynchronous, and time interleaved ADCs. Then on the other end, we have high resolution, but slow ADCs, like the sigma delta ADC. So it uh, makes very, very precise measurements, but it needs, uh, uh, it has a lower bandwidth, meaning we only get to measure very uh, slow signals or a small range of signals. Then what we can observe here is that speed and accuracy are trade-offs. Whenever we need to have more of one, if we ever need more resolution, we have to sacrifice our bandwidth. And if in order to get more bandwidth, we need to sacrifice our resolution. So somewhere here in the middle is the SAR ADC, which aims to balance the two. And here we have a uh, what you call the pipeline ADC, which actually is a more complex form of the SAR ADC. And because of that complexity, it allows us to further the boundary of the trade-off. Now for actual ADC implementations, first we have a the comparator, which is used for the digital inputs for the PIC32. So uh, if you're already, you should, I think you should already be familiar, a comparator basically compares an input signal with a reference voltage, usually half of our VREF, and then whenever our V in is greater than the uh, VRF over two, it will output VDD or digital high and zero otherwise. And then, so this is the quantization part of the ADC. And then our sampling will then be uh, accomplished by a uh, clock, flip flop. Now a more quote unquote improved version of the comparator is the Schmidt trigger. So these are 
sort of harder to make, but basically a comparator with two thresholds. So instead of having a single threshold here, when our signal is noisy, it may it may it has a chance to uh mod it has a chance to flip the output of our comparator. But if we have two thresholds depending on its current state, we can uh we can overlook or we can bypass the noise here. So the transfer characteristic for a normal comparator would just be one straight line, but because the straight trigger, uh, depending on what its current output is, it can modify its threshold value. Now, extending the comparator ADC is the flash ADC, basically having multiple comparators uh, comparing our input signal to different, to different voltage ranges. So basically, our resistor ladder network here acts sort of like a digital to analog converter, wherein the output of the first resistor corresponds to the corresponds to the voltage level or analog voltage level of the first DAC code, and then for the second, and then for the third. So basically, what we have here is a three uh, is a two bit ADC with three comparators. So what you'll notice here, if for example, I want a three bit flash ADC, I will be needing eight comparators and eight resistors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one, one resistor and one comparator for each ADC level we are expecting. So of course, we want to avoid using that too many too many components in our design would mean too many points of failure. So what the counter ramp ADC does is instead of having all of these resistor values at the same time, we use a DAC that we configure and a single comparator. So our DAC, we configure it to go from the lowest DAC value to, and then slowly ramping up to the highest ADC value, and then comparing each value to our input, uh, to our input via a comparator. So basically, what we did was instead of having eight different uh, comparators, we just make eight. We just compare eight different times, wherein we compare, we always change our input. So the problem here is it will be extremely slow. So for a 3-bit counter ramp ADC, we will be needing at least 8 cycles. And if we go more, for example, a 10-bit ADC, we will need a whopping 1,024 clock cycles. So maybe even a sample and hold circuit may not, uh, may not hold that voltage for so long. So what we do is improve on this. So if you're familiar, the counter up ADC searches for our input voltage like in a linear search way. So if you are familiar with programming techniques, we can use binary search instead of the linear search the counter up ADC does. And this is what the successive approximation ADCs do. So uh, one bit at a time, it sets the bits. So for example, it sets the MSB first, compares it with V in. If V in is higher, we retain the set and then set the next bit. So since the next bit makes uh, the output of the DAC higher than the V in, we clear that bit, make it zero, and then we repeat the process again. So basically it's a counter ramp ADC but it uses binary search. So additional notes for using ADCs. So a key parameter to note, or most of the time when dealing with ADCs and microcontrollers is the conversion time. Because this conversion time will determine the timing signals you would need and determines how fast and how fast you can sample and how fast your input can be. 
So usually when you're shopping for ADCs, uh, manufacturers will have a fast, medium, and slow flavor depending on depending on your system requirements. And one last note is that the ADC itself could introduce noise to the input signal, making the measurement inaccurate. So for example, uh, a very precise ADC might only represent noise for its very its uh, less significant bits. So for example, a 16-bit ADC with a reference voltage of 3.3 volts, uh, given those, we would have an LSB of 50 microvolts. Now, if your ADC is very noisy and generates noise greater than 50 microvolts, the information stored in your LSB doesn't mean quite a lot since that only means you're measuring. Uh, you can only measure, uh, you can only differentiate, you can no longer actually differentiate the noise at that LSB. So in summary, in order to convert your analog signal to a digital code, we uh, in hardware, you would require sampling and quantization. So most of our ADCs are differentiated by how they quantize the input. And our uh, sampling circuits adjust to this. And lastly, very fast ADCs are expected to be less precise. And very precise ADCs are expected to be very slow. Now, depending on your system, if you need to be fast or if you need to be precise, is what should affect, uh, should affect your choice in choosing which ADC to use. So that is all for this lecture video. Thank you for watching.